we well we are going to come to this like in 20 seconds so you got time to get there but for now i am going to start with what we've covered last class period we did not cover free fall or the kinematic equation so we're going to do that today um in lab we started work with graphs and we will spend more time with um, graphs in lab than next week and so i know one student said you know i I need more explanation on the graphs, and I will provide more explanation on the graphs in lab next week. Um, we learned a lot about resolving and combining vectors, and that's what all of your homework problems were about, right? So you're getting experience with that, and if you have questions, ask me. So like, I mean, if you have a question right now, oh, you know, I couldn't do this homework problem, there's a good chance that we can help somebody else out too if you have a question. You have a question? Okay, Max and Isabel were just about the same time. Um, I think Max did. So Max will. Is it on the homework? Um, yes, I go ahead and ask a question on the homework. I thought they get your first one of like okay. Type of thing. I just thought like I thought you were saying who has questions. Oh no. no. Okay, Isabel, you got a question on the homework? On uh, number five. Okay, so let me let me go to the homework site and look at number five. And then I'll probably mess everything up trying to copy and paste because that's always what happens. <laughs> Expert. Okay, see, and there's another thing. I went to the wrong site. Fortunately, it won't show you grades here. Expert TA, there we go. And mm, come on. Okay, number five here. Assume that a pilot flies 38 kilometers in a direction, 60 degrees. Now, everybody's going to have those red numbers you probably recognize already. Everyone has different numbers there. That's so you have to do your calculations. You can't just say, oh, the answer is B. Okay. And go with it. So we have this person who is flying, and we're asked to find the distance of the resultant and the angle of the resultant. Now, I'm going to try to copy this using the pen. We'll see if I... That didn't seem to work right. Uh, I'm curious as to see what's going to happen. I mean, nothing failed miserably, so that's a start. So try putting it over here. <laughs> well, that worked perfectly. It's exactly what I wanted to see, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll go to that next. Really? This page contains conflicting changes. I don't want to see the conflicts. I'll figure out how to delete that. I mean, I would have thought that this would have worked, but it didn't. This will work. I'm sorry about the delay here. Okay, going back and trying to do a screen snapshot. What's the quickest way to do a snapshot? The super screen? Yeah, the super button. The super is that this? No. Yeah. No, no. The, the Windows key button on the keyboard and then press. Nope. Okay, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get the snipping tool, which is, I think it's. It's going to tell me, oh, no, you want to use this other one. Okay, so that did it right. Whoops. And I didn't want to eat out to myself. <sighs> Cancel that. Yeah, yeah. That's copy. <laughs> 
So I'm kind of slow at this, as luck would have it. But I can, sorry, we couldn't paste the content. Okay, now, now you're getting on my nerves. You being the program. Go back to this. See this button? It says copy. If this doesn't work, I'm going to give up and not have it. There, it worked. Whew. All right, so now we're going to do the problem. So the first thing, we're doing a physics question. What's the idea involved? What? Okay, it's going to be something with adding vectors. And we need to make sure we understand the question. Actually, I should have said that first. We don't need to draw a picture because the picture is all drawn. But we have two pieces of the flight, which are shown there, A and B. And then R is the resultant. So R is equal to A plus B, as you see up there on the top right. Okay. Anna is giving us a way that works perfectly, but it's not the easiest way. Okay, so there's more than one way to solve this. What Anna said is break each vector into components, then add the x components, and then add the y components. And that will work perfectly for you. And that's a skill you need to have. So if you did it that way, great. It's a great way of doing it. I'm going to do it a different way. A way that is, it, it requires a little more trigonometry, a little less work. And so that is going to be using, well, I said trigonometry, using the laws of sines and the law of cosines. So when I look at this triangle, it's not a right triangle, right? No. That means sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, not correct. Cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse, not correct. A squared plus B squared equals C, C squared, not correct. Those only apply for a right triangle. But I can still use things like the law of sines and law of cosines. So the first thing I'm going to do is extrapolate A for purposes of my geometry. So here I just extrapolate A a little longer. And I know that this angle here, whoops, that is not the color I chose. You can see that I'm hitting it, and it doesn't like to accept it. Let me try that one. Yeah, black. Is it because you're supposed to be typing right now? No, I don't. Well, maybe it is. Why I'm supposed to be try typing right now, I have no idea. Yeah, that is. I wasn't trying to type, hence I didn't recognize that as even a valid option. Okay, so we were given that this was 60 degrees. So if that's 60 degrees, but this angle right here is 15, then I also know that this angle here must be 45 degrees which makes this interior angle, and I'm going to use a different color, 180 degrees minus 45 degrees, which is 135 degrees. Do that again. Okay. So the 60 degrees was given right here. So I just, I have the horizontal, that dashed line is horizontal. And then extrapolation of that same one. So the 60 degrees is just the same angle. And then I was giving this 15 degrees from the horizontal to vector B. So if it's 60 from horizontal to vector A and 15 from horizontal to vector B, then it's 45 between vector B and vector A. And so knowing that that angle was 45 degrees, then I said, okay, the other side, if I have a line like this, and this side's 45 degrees, then calculating this side is just 180 degrees minus that 45, because it's 180 degrees going in a straight line. So this is 135 degrees. So that's how I got this angle here, 135 degrees. 
And now that I have that, I have, as a student I was working with said, oh, I have side angle side, which gives you a unique triangle. Right back in high school geometry class, we learned side, 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 or side, angle, side, or angle, side, angle. All of those define a unique triangle. So this defines a unique triangle, and I can now use the law of sines or cosines. Well, if you look at what I have, I have a side, an angle, and a side. That actually is not going to lend itself to using the law of sines because the law of sines requires that I have both a side and the angle opposite it. I don't have a side and angle opposite. But I can always use, use the law of cosines if I have two sides and an angle. So using the law of cosines, I have, in this case, using A, B, and R, I have the side opposite to the 135 degrees is R. So R squared equals the two sides that are adjacent to the angle minus 2. Remember, I forgot to write down the 2 when I did this in class last time. 2AB cosine of the angle between A and B, which is 135 degrees. I put the angle in with a number here, even though I put symbols for A, B, because I wanted to make sure we know which angle I'm looking at. And I don't have an easy way to designate. I know I could put, oh, let's call it phi, but I didn't. So then I just calculate what R is. So that's going to be, in my case, A was 38 kilometers. And B was 32 kilometers. And so I put that in the calculator, and I'm not going to actually put that in the calculator right now just because of time, because I've already spent 14 minutes on this, and we haven't started the new material. It is important to do this. This is not wasted or lost time, mind you. But I'm not going to put it in the calculator. But that gives me the magnitude of the resultant, which is the first answer here. Sorry. That was the distance, right? R, R, is, R, the, R is the, the magnitude of the, the resultant. Result. Okay. So this right here is what I saw for in red. And then the second one says to find the angle theta that is this angle right. Okay, let's change to green. Part B says to find this angle here. And so what I figure is the easiest way to find that angle is to use the law of sines now to find that angle and then 60 minus that, yes. Subtract from 60, yeah. So now if you go back to what Anna said, you might be more comfortable and say, no, I think Anna's method was easier. And if that's the way you feel, that's fine. Right? Like I said, there's more than one way to do this. This is the way that I see is the shortest, given more familiarity with the geometry and trig trigonometry as we're using here. If it's not your easiest, you don't have to do it this way. Questions about that? Do you feel you understand it better? <laughs> At least I got a couple people who are like, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, going back to the beginning of the lecture, and if you have more questions, you can always be like, Max sent me an email yesterday saying, hey, can we get together and go over some homework? Yes, you can all do that. Also, tomorrow evening, now it turns out that this week and this week only, um, DJ has an appointment actually with the person who is his boss with for the tutoring for you um, from 7 to 8 on Thursday night. So when that appointment's over, he will come here to this room to do tutoring for those available. So it will be a late night session this week for whoever wanted late. Um, he'll come at eight and he said he can, you know, he can run past nine. So there's our first tutoring opportunity for you. Um, his Monday will be a little earlier because he has 
by next Sunday. Excuse me. Because I think he's working at Cooper's Car or something. Um, so he would be 6 to 8 on Sundays and 7 to 9 normally on Thursdays. And it'd be right here in this back room. All physics-related things in this room. Okay, now let's pull out our cell phones or computers or whatever you use for the woo. Yeah, that, that's the spirit. And do some questions. Now, funny thing is, because I keep reusing the same site every class period, I just change. I take the old quiz and save it to a new one and then change the questions. It still has all 13 of you. Well, it should be 14 now because we have one more student registered um, as participating. So that's why it started with 13. So we can all say with a surety that the new student is not yet connected, but she's working on it. So we should be like, you're calling me out, you know? She totally doesn't have an iPhone. <laughs> Isn't that a shame when people don't have iPhones? <laughs> now, you can still use a QR code reader if you don't have an iPhone, but with an iPhone, you just use your camera. Yeah. <laughs> you getting there? All right, she's in. Let's get started. And you know what I'm totally not doing? I'm not going to the wall. Okay. Match each kinetic term, kinematic term, with what it means. Yeah. I'm actually not sure what it looks like on your screens. What's it look like? Oh, yeah, okay. That's easy enough. <laughs> So you can see what the options here are, and then you can choose the right one. And I'm sure it's going to time out before everyone's done, so I will uh, restart it when it times out. I just set it to a minute to give you some time. <laughs> yeah, I figure that's going to be the case. I mean, two people finished. <laughs> and he's still got 10 seconds before our first time's gonna run out. Matt. Hopefully, he didn't reset everything when in time out. Because that would be sad. Yeah, it must not, because we're going to have to four. Halfway home, that's half people answered. <laughs> and I'll restart it again because we still have five people who haven't completed. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the matching takes too long. Four more.
Okay, uh, I'll give it only about another 30 seconds or so and then, and, because we could otherwise, you know, be here a while, but we're all but two in. All right, so let's look at what people answered. So we had 10 people that correctly said, 10 out of 12, the Greek letter delta, what's the Greek letter delta look like? A triangle with a point at the top. It's an equilateral triangle with a point at the top. It means change in, and likewise, all but two people, displacement, change in position, vector. Now, I'm going to tell you, on the test, I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between distance and displacement, just because it's too fuzzy. You know, it is distance... The magnitude of displacement, which it actually says that somewhere in the textbook, the distance is the magnitude of displacement. Or is it the amount of ground covered? That's where it gets fuzzy, right? So I'm not going to ask you on the test to identify that just because I don't want there to be something that could be confusing. Like, well, we were all going to lose a point there. Average speed. Nine people correctly said the average speed is the distance divided by change in time because it's a scalar. Average velocity is displacement divided by change in time, a vector. The acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. I am missing the divided by change in time there. That, that's a mistake on my part. I'm sorry. I did not catch that. Distance, change in the position vector. Um, or excuse me. Whoa. Whoa. Average velocity, the change in position is a vector divided by time. I missed that. Okay, I have, I was going to say, I had it on some of them apparently, but not all of them. Um, so average velocity is change in position, vector divided by change in time. Average speed, change in position, scalar divided by time. Um, well, I don't know what's going on with these ones at the bottom. Because... Yeah, the other things that people answered. Okay, so the wrongs. Okay, I didn't think I had that many. Okay, let's just go on. That, that learning experience for me. Turn off that. How do we add vectors graphically? Select all that apply. So there's more than one here that's correct. It is not possible is not one of the correct options. <laughs> What? You, you need me to show the link? That's not it. That's not it either. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of options there. Um, I, it's the one that says I. You can't even. The, the thing that says I is not highlighted for me. Yeah, that didn't work. And well, you, yeah, you can type that link at the tarp, top. That's going to be the, the most successful at this point. Are you in again, Hannah? No? Well, be, because of time, keep trying to get in because we have more questions, but I'm going to show the answers and move on. So we had 100% of the people said use the tail to tip method. That's how we do it graphically. 
Excellent. Um, using a ruler and compass. You do need to use a ruler and compass if you're going to have the correct result. So on the first exam, I will probably have a problem where you have to graphically add vectors. And so I will provide rulers and compasses, but you'll need to do it accurately. Um, one person said tail to tail. Two people said tip to tip. Those would not add vectors. They would effectively subtract vectors. And nobody said it's not possible. That's good because, of course, it is possible. Okay. And that's not exactly what I want, but it works. For this picture, during what time frame is the object accelerating? That is, the acceleration is not equal to zero. So your time frames are, one, it's always accelerating. Two, always, except for from 20 to 40 seconds. Only from zero to 20 seconds is it not accelerating. Only from 20 to 40. What? Wait a minute. Yeah, these are opposites. Always, except for that, and only. So it's only accelerating 20 to 40, or only from 40 to 50. Which one of those rings true? And apparently I need to give you more time because only five people got it in. Now six, seven, eight. All right. Ten. Eleven, twelve. I'm on the last two. I honestly don't know who hasn't answered, just in case people are thinking I'm looking at them. <laughs> okay, well, when this time runs out, I'm going to move on because, well, like I said, our class is now more than half over. By the way, do you guys know that we're 10% of the way through the semester? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, let's look at what the 12 people said. So the majority of the 12 by one, excuse me? Yeah, okay. I thought that would do it. No, I did. <laughs> yeah, did it twice. Do it once. So the majority said it's always accelerating. That's incorrect. What? So, so, so I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about it. Okay, we had one person said always except for from 20 to 40 seconds. That person was the correct one. No, hmm? uh, <laughs> yes, yes it is. Okay, and then we had some other answers here. So let's talk about this. Why is it that it's not accelerating from 20 to 40, but accelerating everywhere else? Okay. The acceleration, acceleration is a change in velocity. Now, this is one-dimensional motion, so we're not worried about direction here. So a change in speed will mean it's accelerated. Well, from our lab yesterday, on a graph of position versus time, how do you determine the speed? The slope. The slope. On the graph of distance per time, the slope is the distance over time. Yeah. So if the slope is changing, then the speed is changing, and it's accelerating. If the slope is not changing, then it's not accelerating. And so you just look at the slope, and you say, okay, the slope is changing from here to here, but then it's a constant slope here, and then it changes again. So it's accelerating here, and it's accelerating here. And so what is the object accelerating is from 0 to 20 and then from 40 to 50, or every all the time except for from 20 to 40 seconds. Does that make sense now, Max? 
does. All right. I did it before you go into everything. I didn't see those things constantly. Okay. Let's I think I have one more question here. We'll see. Nope. Okay. Then let's start with the whole teaching thing. I hear it's a good thing to do in class sometimes, usually. So here is the graph we just looked at. And next to it, we have a graph of velocity versus time. And I know somebody put on a comment on the textbook, are we always going to have these three graphs together? We're not always going to have them together. We're putting them together right now. We'll put them all together in lab next week because we want to make sure we understand the relationships between them. Then once we understand that, we'll just look at a graph and be able to interpret that graph instead of having all three. So the graph in green here, we have the speed or velocity, right? It's one dimensional, it's really fundamentally the same on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And I'm sorry, I clipped off the time in this picture. And so from zero to 20 seconds, this, the slope was, well, was the slope positive or negative from zero to 20 seconds on the first graph, the red one? Positive. positive. So what does that tell us about the velocity? Okay, that, that was gonna be my next question. That the slope is positive says that it has a positive velocity. And then, because the slope is getting steeper, that means the speed is increasing. And so that's why the first stretch here, we have a speed that's increasing. Now, could I tell it's increasing at a linear rate from that? Not with my eyeball, I can't. That, you would have to, you know, analyze the curve using some tools. Then we have a stretch where it's traveling at a constant velocity. It's not at zero velocity, it's a constant velocity. Remember, acceleration is change in velocity. So it's traveling at constant velocity, and then what's happening to the slope from 40 seconds on? The slope is decreasing, it's becoming flatter, so that means the speed is dropping. It's still a positive speed because it's still a positive slope, but it's becoming flatter, so the velocity is going down. So in terms of acceleration, if the speed is increasing, is that a positive or negative acceleration? Positive. If the speed is constant, what does that tell you about acceleration? Zero. And if the speed is decreasing, what does it tell you? Negative. Now, using what we've already learned, I'll get to you in a second. Using what we've already learned from analyzing a position versus time graph, this here is a velocity versus time graph. Really? Cool. I can do this, maybe. Oh, when it's zoomed in, I have writing can't be done. Um, so I can't, I was just gonna write time, so it's not important. If it's a speed or velocity versus time graph, what would the slope of this graph be? Just equation wise. Delta what over delta what? It's rise over run. So what's the rise? It's the change in velocity. Over the change in time is the run. But what do we call the change in velocity over change in time? Acceleration. So the slope of the velocity versus time graph is acceleration. And so I can look at this graph and I can say, okay, from 0 to 20 seconds, I had a positive acceleration because it has a positive slope. The slope is not changing, so it's a constant acceleration. And then from 20 to 40 seconds, the slope is zero, so the acceleration is zero. From 40 to 50 seconds, the slope is negative and a constant slope, so it's a constant negative acceleration. So that gives us our last graph here of the accelerations. Okay, what was your question? Oh, on the book, wasn't it like acceleration was positive and negative in your reference frame? Okay, yeah. there, there was a lot of discussion about reference frame in the, in the book. And reference frame is always important. You have to specify what your reference frame is. So, you know, traditionally, for instance, to the right, we consider positive. That was my right. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so traditionally to the right, we consider positive. But you have to specify, because you can choose to make to the left positive. You can choose to make down positive. Somebody said that their physics, their college physics teacher 
said that we use gravity as positive downward. I do not. I use gravity, the magnitude of the acceleration of gravity is 9.80 meters per second squared. The direction is down. Because we define up as positive, that makes it a vector that's in the negative positive direction. Which I know can be a little confusing, but that is that is the traditional way, the way most physicists do it. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, Annie. Why do we not consider acceleration positive or negative in terms of the object itself that's being accelerated? I don't know what in terms of the object itself means. So like if the if there's a ball going up and mm -hmm. it's traveling in a positive direction, and the acceleration is going in the the acceleration of gravity is the opposite direction of it. But when it starts going down and the acceleration of gravity is going in the same direction, the ball itself is traveling. Right? So why would the acceleration not be positive if the ball was traveling? Okay. We, we define our directions based on usually a stationary reference frame. And so if, if I take, for instance, my stopper, and I tend ball still make this call. If I take the stopper and I throw it up, when it, there were some questions about the throwing. There were a lot of good questions as I was reading through. I read all the comments this time. As I'm throwing it, while it's in my hand, it's going to be accelerating upward because I am forcing it to accelerate upward. And so it's acceleration while I'm throwing it up. It's not the acceleration of gravity. It's the acceleration that is being caused by all the forces acting on it. Once it leaves my hand, then we say it's in free fall. In free fall, for practical sense, means that it's free of anything except for gravity and whatever atmosphere you have. It, it would be ideal if we had no atmosphere, but we have atmosphere. It would be ideal for physics problems, not ideal for life. But we do have atmosphere, which is ideal for life, and so that atmosphere is going to affect it. And so somebody talked about terminal velocity. There's a terminal velocity if you have an atmosphere. If there's no atmosphere, no, there's no terminal velocity. Well, I, I said in my response, the speed of light is your terminal velocity. Nothing's going to reach that. So once it leaves my hand, it's in free fall. And when it's in free fall, it's going to have a constant acceleration due to gravity that's going to be downward. We actually define down. Now, I was looking at the Wolfram Alpha, and it gave a little, you know, the of gravity is different from the, the local down. But I have always been taught that down is not the direction toward the center of the Earth per se, which I think is what Wolfram Alpha is using, but the direction of the acceleration of gravity. That's how we turn down. I use a plumb bob. In whatever direction it goes, that's down. And so the acceleration of gravity is 9.80 meters per second squared down. Now there was discussion about, you know, I had a textbook that said 9.81 meters per second squared. There is variation in the acceleration of gravity depending on where you are on Earth. If you are at the equator, the acceleration of gravity is going to be lower than 9.80 meters per second squared. If you're at the North Pole, it's going to be higher than 9.80 meters per second squared. David asked why. The acceleration of gravity comes as a result of the force of the Earth's gravity. And that force is dependent on a number of things. We usually, for a general physics class, we just say it depends on its elevation above the center of the Earth and the mass of the Earth. But it's more complicated. You can have two locations on Earth where the surface of the Earth is the same level and the sources of gravity are different because you might have some really dense rocks under the ground here. That's going to make the local gravity higher. You might have low density rocks here, that's going to make it lower. Small, small. Yes, there's small variations. Okay, Russell raised his hand before you started. So, Russell, what was your question? Does the change That doesn't affect gravity per se, but it affects the effective gravity. So, and, and so I, I haven't answered David's question yet, and I will use that by the time I get to the answer. Yes? What does the denseness of something have to do with the change in gravity? Okay, so density is 
how much mass you have per unit volume. Right. Mass is a measurement of how much stuff is present. Right. And the gravitational force, somebody asked, what causes it? It's a fundamental force, which means fundamentally we don't know. It's just something that's caused by mass. And so if you have something that's more dense, it has more mass per unit volume, which means it's causing more gravitational pull per unit volume. Okay, so, so essentially the heavier something is, the more gravity it exerts on, on the more force of an exact object. Yeah. The more force it exerts but on the, an object. If you have two objects that are the same mass but one is smaller, something at its surface is going to have a stronger pull on the one that's smaller that's more dense. If it's on a surface, if you're the same distance away, it would be the same. Okay, so going back to Dave's question, why is it different? One reason is, of course, the local variation density. One is ground elevation. You know, what is the tallest mountain on Earth? Everybody says Everest. What? Not it, it's not Everest. Well, it depends on what you de desi what you designate to mean tallest mountain. Is it the highest above sea level? The highest above sea level is Mount Everest. The highest elevation from the center of the Earth is not Mount Everest. The highest elevation above the center of the Earth is, I think it was in Chile. It, it's, I had never heard of this until I looked up last week. But there, there is a mountain that the local ground level, that is sea level at its location, is like one and three quarter miles higher than sea level at um, where Mount Everest is. And so the, up, the, the top of the mountain is way above the top of Everest in terms of distance from the center of the Earth. But then there's the third one, what is actually the tallest mountain? Because the true answer to that is Mauna Kea. Nobody counts Mauna Kea because the base of Mauna Kea is far below sea level. And so it doesn't stick up that high above sea level, but measuring from the foot of the mountain to the top of the mountain, that's the tallest mountain on Earth. Okay, so I don't know how I got off on that one. That was not necessary. But, but the Earth is not spherical in shape. Right. So the Earth is bulging out at the equator. Why? Because it's spinning. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably just teach you anyway. Um, the, the Earth is spinning. And so inertia of the material makes it want to travel in a straight line. What is inertia? The propensity of something to travel in a straight line, unless something acts on it. When we get to Newton's laws, that will become a big thing. So the Earth kind of flattens out, so it's got a bigger waistline. And as a result, it's not as tall. So it's short and squat. So if you're at the poles, you're closer to the center of the Earth, which actually results in you having a higher acceleration of gravity. So the average acceleration of gravity in, in Alaska is somewhere like 9.82 meters per second squared. Whereas here at the equator, it's like 9.78 or so. On continental United States, it's pretty much 9.80. Now, if you look at Wolfram Alpha, if you look at my answers that I put, it gives you things like, for Lincoln, 9.17 or 9.18. That's not right. It gives you like 9.15 for Denver. But the measured value of Denver is 9.798 or something like that. Very close to 9.80. Why the difference? Well, one does not take into account the local variations. So basically, commonly in the United States, 9.80 is pretty much the right value to use. I think textbooks that use 9.81 meters per second squared for acceleration of gravity are just trying to make sure the students remember that there's three significant digits there, not two. And they're saying, well, there's places where that's correct. Question? Yeah, someone was saying like gravity was comparable to the attraction between people. Like, that like we're all attracted. I don't know. Somebody commented back on something I commented on. And I don't think it was really. But exactly, there's attraction between everybody. Yes. But that's not the same as gravity. That's just, is it? There is a gravitational attraction between all objects with mass. Mm -hmm. Gravity is unipolar, it's always attractive. But 
but is that direction down? Like, is well, it no. Just, like, not you, you are attracted to, um, to Anna. You're attracted to me, but not as much as I am, not Anna. <laughs> she, okay. she looked at me funny when I said that. So, you're attracted to me, but not as much because we're farther away. But not if you were like five times as big as Anna, I'd be more attracted to you. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And we'll learn that equation coming up. But is the direction of my attraction down if it's gravitational? No, or it's, 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 straight it's attracted. Down? It's toward straight ahead. So then how is it the same thing as gravity? It, um, well, the gravity, the Earth, we're attracted toward the center of the Earth, right? Right. And because the Earth is really massive, we're attracted toward the center of the Earth with much greater force than we're attracted to each other. So it's just nowhere near 19 inches or something. It's, well, force, not acceleration, right. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, moving forward. Okay. <laughs> Kinematic equations. We have equations that we use to solve problems with motion. And these are the equations we use. Now, in the calculus-based class, we derived like this one here. We're not going to drive it here. And I spent so much time talking about other things. We're not going to solve any problems. I have like three problems I was planning on solving in class today. This here is the definition of the average velocity. This is the definition of the average acceleration. For you guys, we will always use constant acceleration. The acceleration may change. So you have this constant acceleration from 0 to 5 seconds and this constant acceleration from 5 to 10 seconds. But you're never going to have a changing acceleration. Only the calculus-based students are going to have the situation of a changing acceleration. This here is the definition of average if you have a constant acceleration. So keep in mind, everything we're doing in this class is constant acceleration. Combining these equations, this here is simply taking this equation and solving it for change in x. So that's, that's already given. That's the definition of the average velocity. And then the equation below is taking the definition of acceleration and solving it for delta V. And then if you take this average equation and combine those two, right? So you can do it without calculus as long as you have specified as constant acceleration. Then you get this equation, which covers probably over 90% of what you're going to do with kinematic equations. Now you don't have to have this memorized, but like if you're, pre-med and going to take the MCAT, well, you're definitely going to have to have it memorized for the MCAT. It's one of the equations you'll have to know. What that is is the position is equal to the initial position, that subscript zero means starting. I was taught to say ought, um, or, well, I say ought and not. Um, it, only one of them, I guess, is technically correct, but both are used, one just much more rarely, and that's the one I use more often. <laughs> Um, so the initial position plus the initial speed multiplied by how much time has passed since the initial time plus one half the acceleration multiplied by how much time has passed squared. And then this final equation doesn't have time in it. Now, every equation on this page except for the final one is a vector equation. The final one is a scalar equation. I didn't put vector signs because we're learning one-dimensional motion. When we're learning two-dimensional motion, we will use this equation with x's, and then we'll use it with y's for the two perpendicular directions. So I'm going to end with one, well, I was going to say one calculation. Yeah, I'll do one calculation, and then we'll call it quits for the day. And so what is that one calculation? Going back to lab, how, are you serious? How long did it take? for the ball to drop one meter. Okay, we can calculate how long it should have been. Using that equation, I need to define my coordinate system. So I'm going to define my coordinate system where up is the positive x direction. So that's what that means. Up is the positive x direction. And I'm going to define 
x initial is equal to 1 meter and x final is equal to 0. Now my acceleration is minus 9.80 meters per second squared. Why does it have a minus sign? Because it's going down. And I pointed out the picture in the textbook, which is what I want to draw, is somewhat confusing because we draw an arrow like this for the acceleration because it's pointing down. But the minus sign also means it pointing down. So if I draw it just like this, what that would technically mean is it's going up. <laughs> you know, the acceleration is up. But to correct that, I can just put that little hat over the y means in the direction of the y-axis. So I'm going to use a is equal to minus 9.80 meters per second squared because it's in the negative direction. So if I take this equation and I solve it for our given situation, my x final was zero, right? My x initial was one. My v initial was zero. I'm only putting in the zeros right now. If I want to solve that for time, I'll have to subtract x0 from both sides. So I have minus x0 is equal to 1 half a t squared. Then I need to multiply everything, well, divide everything actually, by 1 half a. And so I'm left with t squared is equal to, if you divide by 1 half, that's the same as multiplying by 2. So minus 2x0 over a square root it and right now you might think oh we got a problem don't drop the minus sign because it looks like you have a problem when i put in the numbers minus two times one meter divided by minus 9.80 meters per second squared you see the minuses cancel and I have the square root of 2 divided by 9.80. If you do the square root of 2 divided by 9.80, what do you get? 2 divided by 9.8. Square root. You get 0. 0.452. So that's the time it should have taken to follow one second. All right, I know I did go four seconds, four seconds, four minutes over. I apologize. Have a great day. How did you get that x equals zero?